My name is Laura and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar and today we're going to explore art, but not just any art. What follows are the paintings and drawings of self-professed alien abductees. Paintings and drawings which claim to show the unearthly beings which took them against their will. In 1992, the prestigious Roper Center for Public Opinion Research conducted a poll in order to estimate how many Americans have had an alien abduction experience. The resulting study concluded with an estimate of nearly 4 million people. To put that into perspective, that is close to three times the number of active personnel currently serving in the United States Armed Forces. It is no surprise then that the number of testimonies and drawings on the subject of alien abduction is vast and terrifying. Before we begin, I would like to take a quick moment to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of fascinating classes that combine video lessons with hands-on projects. The perfect place for curious minds to explore new interests, delve into existing passions, or simply embrace unhindered creativity. Whether you are a master scholar or a dabbler looking to begin a new creative journey, Skillshare offers classes on all manner of compelling topics, from photography to film and video to graphic design to creative writing, to suit all skill levels and schedules. Discovery is a lifelong adventure, and with a community of fellow creatives to help encourage you along the way, Skillshare can help inspire you to find and develop your innate creative spark. I've always wanted to learn how to paint, but often find myself intimidated by failure. But with Rosalie Hazlitt's class, Watercolour in the Woods, A Beginner's Guide to Painting the Natural World, I am guided at every step by a knowledgeable and passionate master of her craft, from how to gather my materials to creating texture in my paintings. With no ads, premium classes, and top teacher staff picks, Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, so there's no excuse. And to help make your creative journey even easier, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click my exclusive link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare, so you can start exploring your creativity today. In 2012, the photographer Stephen Hursk attended a UFO convention in Connecticut. There, he met several self-proclaimed alien abductees and asked them to describe and illustrate their experiences. One lady called Janet presented him with this, a hastily drawn sketch of several bulbous-headed beings encircling her screaming boyfriend, as they took both him and her from their beds in the middle of the night. Telling her story, Janet explained that, in December 1995, she landed on Johnston Atoll, an isolated island in the Pacific Ocean, which was under the control of the US military for almost 70 years. Used as a testing site for novel weapons, including nuclear and biological, it was an airbase and secret facility that today, although demilitarized, still bears the environmental scars of all that took place there. At the time, Janet was a civilian working for the military, and was immediately knocked off guard when, after landing, she was greeted by a man who told her, you've landed on a joint US military ET base. Describing her experience to the photographer, she explained that a year later, in 1996, she was woken in the middle of the night, suddenly, by six figures with large heads and large eyes. They are claimed to have lifted her from her bed and carried her away, surrounded by military personnel on either side. Screaming and terrified, she noticed that the six beings had three fingers, with one opposing finger. They were not human and resembled what she described as traditional ETs. As she pleaded for someone to come and rescue her, certain that on such a small island someone could hear her crying, one of the beings on the right-hand side that was carrying her foot turned to her and said, go ahead and scream all you want. You're in an energy field and no one can hear you. Janet explained that she was carried down to the beach, 
her boyfriend was also taken, and she stated that they were both put into a little beam ship and launched out past the coral reef and into an underwater facility. There, she was made to sit in a chair and watch as the beings did something to her boyfriend. He screamed for the entirety. This is the scene that Janet chose to illustrate, the helpless moment she was unable to stop whatever was happening to her and her boyfriend. Janet does not know how much time went by before they returned her to her bed. Equally, she does not know what, if anything, they did to her. Her memories are disjointed. She did, however, describe being sprayed with something. It sounded like a hiss, and she was paralyzed. After the beings left, she was once again able to move, but not forget, not entirely. I was angry, she stated. I had to act normal. And yet, after all that she had seen and experienced that night, she could never be so again. Whilst most abductees claim to have encountered grey aliens, thin-bodied humanoid beings with large hairless heads and dark almond-shaped eyes, not all interactions center on these life forms. Indeed, Saskia von Essen, a German woman who claims to have encountered many different types of extraterrestrials throughout her life, has shared a sketch of a goblin-like creature with round button eyes, an entity that she says she has observed on at least four separate occasions. One of these experiences took place in the early 1990s. It was night and her young son was sleeping in her bedroom, on the floor beside her bed. Careful not to wake him, Von Essen moved to the bed and turned out the light, lying on her left side. Soon after, she felt something feel its way under the covers and slowly slide up her right hip. Her hand was close by, resting against her hip, and so, thinking this something was her son's little hand, searching for hers under the covers, she reached out to hold it. It was then that she realized the hand was not her son's. In fact, according to her description, it wasn't even human. With only three or four fingers, the hand was incredibly thin, so much so that when she squeezed it, the fingers pushed one over the other. When Von Essen squeezed the hand, it was immediately and roughly torn out of hers. Startled, she then threw herself around in the bed and caught sight of a small figure scurrying away, very almost tripping over her sleeping son on the floor as it did. Catching itself as it moved, it hurried next to or behind a nearby linen cupboard. There, it disappeared. In the darkness, Von Essen's vision was limited. The figure was just a kind of shadow or silhouette, around 90 to 100 centimeters tall. To better express what she saw, she produced a sketch of the nighttime encounter, illustrating the linen cupboard behind which the thing appeared to vanish. Curiously, the cupboard was no more than five centimeters away from the wall, ruling out the possibility that the figure could have found any space there to conceal itself. Instead, it was as though it had simply faded away to nothingness. After this experience, Von Essen was able to fall asleep. When she awoke the next morning, however, she realized her encounter was far from over. Looking to the end of her bed, she claims that she was surprised to see something she initially thought was a deer. It was then that the supposed deer opened its eyes, and, as if she had been the one to startle it, vanished into thin air. Only after it was gone did Von Essen realize that what she had seen was not a deer, but some sort of peculiar, inquisitive observer. As shown in the sketch which she made after the encounter, it had large, round button eyes, and a round head, rather than oblong like a deer. It has been suggested that the creature was able to transform its external shape, and under the influence of this mirage, Von Essen at first thought she was seeing a familiar shape, a deer, rather than the extraterrestrial intruder that was actually in her bedroom. A chilling encounter, indeed but not the only one for Von Essen. While she cannot say whether or not this interaction resulted in abduction, 
she is in no doubt that she has been taken by otherworldly entities on other occasions. In addition to this goblin deer-like figure, she also claims to have encountered traditional grey aliens, and also a robotic man and blonde man with large round staring eyes who communicated with her telepathically. What their intentions are, von Essen does not know. All she knows is that she has been visited, on more than one occasion, and that the beings who visited her were not from Earth. Alien abductions are reported by people from all walks of life, even by the famous. The Moody Blues are a British rock band that first formed in 1964 and have since sold over 70 million albums worldwide, with 18 having achieved platinum and gold certification. In 2018, the band was inaugurated into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and despite critical disapproval for much of their career, the group is now considered to have had a profound influence on shaping modern culture and music. And if this is true, it has peculiar and perhaps sinister implications. For the Moody Blues, by their own admission, were also influenced after a strange encounter on the side of a motorway, with what they claim were extraterrestrials. The co-founder and drummer of the band, Graham Edge, recalled the event in 1991 for the Flying Saucer Review. The year was 1966, and the band was driving down the M6 motorway from Manchester to London at around 2am when a bright light suddenly appeared and went past them. Everyone became highly excited as to what the light could be, Edge recalled. He initially thought it was a red light on top of a radio tower, and yet as the light continued to zigzag across the sky, it became clear that they were looking at something inexplicable. Perplexed, the band members pulled over and got out of their car so as to get a better look. It was then that things became even stranger. As soon as they left their car, Edge described how an odd stillness descended over them. No road traffic came in either direction, and there were none of the usual nocturnal animal rustlings or bird noises. It was quite uncanny, Edge explained stating that he and his bandmates were mesmerised as if in a dream. According to his recollection, they then watched the object land in a field close by. It was, as Edge described, like a fat cigar with a low protrusion on the top, with seven dull red lights on top. Unsure as to what they were looking at, the band studied the object from afar, until, gripped simultaneously with dread and panic, they retreated to their car and fled. This experience is said to have left Edge a changed man, and indeed a few years after the incident, when someone jokingly asked him what the aliens looked like, he hurriedly grabbed a pen and paper and drew a sketch of an alien of which he had supposedly had a mental impression. To him it was by no means a joke. What he and the others had seen that night had been serious. And so, what had they seen? Edge's sketch, although simplistic, has the characteristics associated with a typical grey alien. And yet, according to Mike Pinder, the band's keyboard player at the time, Edge did not delve into alien literature, and to the best of his knowledge, that type of alien was not popularly known at the time. Alongside Edge's alien sketch, he also produced drawings of the craft and the place of their sighting. Although Edge seems profoundly influenced by what he had seen, he was by no means the only member of the band to have been affected. After their experience, their music changed. Originally a rock-pop band, they began to release all kinds of cosmic albums, perception-altering psychedelic rock with titles such as Days of Future Past and Long Distance Voyager. Pinder also recounted the same story, providing the additional detail that they ended up arriving home three hours late, indicating that the band might have experienced missing time in the course of their sighting. 
Time skips combined with the odd stillness which Edge reported as they witnessed the UFO are common traits amongst those who have been abducted. When the drawing of the alien from Edge's mental impression is added to the equation, it may suggest that the band suffered an abduction experience that night. Indeed, one of their songs, supposedly inspired by their extraterrestrial experience called Stepping in a Slide Zone, written by the band's bass guitarist John Lodge, could add even more credence to the suggestion that the band was abducted. Certain lyrics, such as the air raced by, there was no sound, we drifted high above the ground, and help me please, I thought I said, then something happened in my head, are all similar to descriptors used by others who claim to have experienced abductions. Whether these lyrics are merely creative license, or based upon something real, is of course anyone's guess. However, members of the band have always recounted their alleged experience earnestly, focusing on the creative inspiration which it gave them, without delving too much into the experience itself. And yet, from an observer's perspective, it is undeniably haunting. Indeed, when asked about the event in 2009, Mike Pinder had this to say, Neither of us, he or Edge, remembers anything except seeing it and then being back in the car and driving away. And so, what exactly happened to them in the time in between? It is always easier to ignore or deny the truth than to deal with it. But if you are forced, like I was, to deal with it because of an experience with an alien, then you come to a point where you rethink and accept the fact that we are not alone. These are the words of Caroline Laxon, a physician in her fifties from northern Germany, who launched a website dedicated to sharing an experience which she claims forever changed her life. The year was 1987, and Laxon was 21 years old. She and her family had travelled to Sacramento, California on vacation. One particular night, in the early hours of the 14th of July, she retired to bed just after midnight, around 12.15am. It had been a long day, and she lay in the dark thinking of all that she had done and seen the past two weeks. Sleep didn't immediately find her. After 10 to 20 minutes, she describes being disturbed by a sound, a quiet, dull humming similar to a transformer. Not only that, she had the feeling that something was wrong in her room. It was as though someone had entered, a confusing thing for Laxon as she had locked the door before getting into bed. Concerned, she wanted to look about the room to see if there was anybody there. When she tried to open her eyes, however, she found that she couldn't. She couldn't even move her eyelids, let alone open them. Her entire body was likewise paralysed, and had been ever since she had first heard the low humming sound. Becoming increasingly panicked, she continued to try to open her eyes. When she eventually succeeded, she claims to have seen something chilling. A human-like figure standing straight in front of her bed. Large-headed, with two arms and two legs, the figure was looking at the centre or abdomen of her body, leaning slightly forward as it did. Laxon claims she was only able to keep her eyes open for a maximum of 30 seconds, being compelled to close them, not from drowsiness, but because of some strange and unknown force. Paralysed and still hearing the humming sound, she writes that it was at this point that she realised she was completely at the mercy of whatever being was in her room. There wasn't a way to come out of this situation. But still, she struggled against it. In her head, she called out for Cora, the lady who cared for her grandmother who was with them on vacation. Her grandmother was asleep in the room next door, and Laxa knew Cora would be close by, ready to help her grandmother in the night, on a mattress in the hallway in front of her door. She couldn't speak, but desperate and scared, she hoped Cora would somehow sense there was an emergency and bring help. She didn't, and so Laxon remained frozen on the bed. After a couple of minutes, she states that she was once again able to open her eyes. 
The being was still in her room, but had moved, turned by about 90 degrees, looking at the door. Laxon suspects that it had somehow known what she had been thinking, her internal plea to Cora. As before, no more than 30 seconds later, her eyes involuntarily closed. Immediately afterwards, the sound stopped and she was able to move. When she opened her eyes, the figure was gone. In the years since her experience, Laxon has drawn and painted the being that she saw many, many times, using different materials and, in her own words, developing the quality of expression in the sense of a realistic representation of what she saw. She even explains that she is doing a self-taught art course, presumably in the hopes of better capturing the creature that visited her that night in California. Undoubtedly, the figure in her artwork is haunting, describing it as human-like, but not like you and me, strange and with large yellow eyes and a blue-white aura, Laxon firmly believes it was extraterrestrial. As shown in a watercolour painting she completed in 2000, she believes the being was wearing some sort of breathing device. She also has a sketch of herself in bed, eyes forced shut, as the creature watched over her. After Normalcy returned to her room, Laxcombe was quick to write down her experience. She also claims to have looked at her watch. The time was 1.30 am, suggesting that over an hour had passed since she went to bed. And yet, after lying awake for 10 to 20 minutes, the encounter only lasted a few minutes. She writes that it is hard to imagine that the encounter lasted for an hour, maybe five minutes in total, maybe a little more or less, but not an hour. And so, what had happened during the rest of the time? Laxon cannot say. She states that she has no recollection of being, for example, pulled into a UFO, as some alleged abductees have claimed. But that is, of course, not to say that an abduction did not take place. As other cases suggest, details about what happens after an abductee is taken are not always retained. For Laxon's part, she says that she did all that she could to figure out what had happened. After checking the time, she left her room and woke Cora to see if she had seen or felt anything. She hadn't. Laxon also searched the house and garden in an attempt to locate the figure that she had seen. There were no signs of disturbances in her room, either on the floor where the alleged extraterrestrial had stood or on the window. Unable to sleep, she lay in bed with the door open until her stepbrother entered the house at around 3am. Talking with him, she was shocked to discover that some two years ago, he had seen a UFO in the sky outside their house. It had zigzagged, moving quickly, disappearing before he was able to show it to his mother. Was this somehow connected to Laxon's experience? Had the being, whatever it was, been visiting her more times than that single night. Today, Laxon has immersed herself in research to try to explain what she saw. She writes that she was not interested in UFOs or aliens before that night, and indeed knew nothing about the subject matter, just as she has never painted or drawn as much as she has in pursuit of capturing on canvas the strange figure who stood over her as she slept that night in Sacramento. John E. Mack was a Harvard professor and psychologist who believed that many abductees were not mentally ill, but had actually experienced a real event. In an interview, Mack explained that when he heard someone who was mentally ill recount a psychotic episode, he would get the sense that what they were saying never happened. Yet, when it came to what he believed to be genuine experiences of alien abductions, he described them as being of sound mind, individuals who doubt themselves and recount a seemingly real, intense experience, something happening to their bodies. And such a description most certainly seems to be the case when it comes to the experiences of Miriam Bell Mia, 
a retired French computer engineer who claims to have been abducted repeatedly throughout her life. In a testimony written for a 2019 magazine article, she recounted her first experience as having occurred around the age of five or six. At the time, she had no idea what aliens were, and thought they were like pixies with black almond-shaped eyes. Mysteriously, Belmere described how she wasn't scared of them, even though she had no idea why they were there in her bedroom at night. In later life, she developed the belief that at this stage, the aliens were merely visiting, so as to prepare her for what they were going to do with her when she got older. And indeed, as she grew up, the aliens continued to visit her. Belmere, she explained, rationalised these experiences, telling herself that she was just dreaming, despite the mysterious marks and bruises she found on her body. For all of her attempts to ignore what was happening to her, she struggled to shake the feeling of innate trauma. And so, she received therapy and underwent hypnotic regression. It was then that she remembered several abduction experiences. One abduction is said to have occurred in 1987, when Belmere was on holiday in a chalet in the French Alps. During the night, she remembers hearing a clicking sound which woke her up. Then she noticed that the skylight in the roof above her was open, and that a cord had come down from the sky and was connected to her. As she saw this, she was completely paralysed, the only part of her which she could move being her eyes. The next thing she knew, she was lying on a table in a huge transparent dome, surrounded by small aliens and a larger grey alien, which she described as looking like a praying mantis. Years later, she sketched a drawing of this experience showing the dome and the examination room that she was taken to many times during her life. Balmere described how, in the room, she was completely covered in a gelatinous substance, with the cord still inside of her. She stated that the cord went up to her right kidney and caused her pain. Balmere also recounted how she levitated above the table during the examination by the mysterious aliens. Terrifyingly, she believes that the aliens would routinely take her eggs from her body in order to use them for genetic engineering. After learning about her experiences, Balmere decided to start an initiative in France to help others cope with their experiences. She did this with Nicolas Dumont, a clinical psychologist who also claims to have been abducted. Their group is called Cerro France and has over 50 members all of whom claim to be abductees, including many professional psychologists who are well qualified to help others. Together, they provide a support group for people who claim to have gone through similar traumatic experiences, and focus on helping them function in society. After all, generally speaking, society does not want to listen to these people and their experiences. Often, they are shunned humiliated or forced to suppress their experiences. Many professionals who have come forward in an attempt to speak about abduction phenomena have had their lives and careers destroyed. Certainly, Balmere herself only publicised her experiences after retiring from her profession as a computer engineer, as she feared that such admissions would cost her her job. It is thus tragic to consider just how many people in the world today have undergone the most horrific experiences one can imagine. Non-consensual medical experiments, kidnappings and psychological manipulations by unknown beings, only to be greeted with antipathy or dismissal by those around them. When this happens, the reasons for their experiences are lost, with the only outlets being groups like Cerro France who know that they have no hope in solving this dilemma, only in learning to cope with it. And how to cope, indeed. As if there is even an inkling of truth in the experiences reported by abductees, then we as humans, despite living in a universe populated by other intelligent beings, are alone. 
completely at the mercy of creatures that not only come from the shadows, but benefit from our determination to keep them there. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe for more of the paranormal. And if you cannot wait until my next video, why not watch the one suggested on screen now? Until next time.